Hello, this is Professor Reardon for CPSC 526 at the University of Calgary. This is lecture 13 on firewalls. So firewalls are network security tools that we use to help harden, secure a network against external attacks. So the main motivation you can think of is you have an organization with hundreds or thousands of computers running all these different services that they're offering the world and you want to have some mechanism to protect them from network security threats which may come about. We know that network security threats exist. The easiest way to defend would be to simply not have computers offering services on the network, but that is not a luxury that the defenders have. They have to offer services, and this is one of the asymmetries that exist between the attackers and the defenders. So one way that we can reduce the amount of attack surface is to disallow traffic that is heading to ports for services that we shouldn't be running in the first place. Because we have all these computers that may be running services on them, and if we configure a computer to be a server, it may be offering lots of different services across different ports. Maybe the services are not actually supposed to be used by anyone on the internet. Uh, or maybe these computers shouldn't be running the service at all. And it's not that they are intentionally doing it. It's, a, for example, a misconfiguration. But the point remains is that if we have vulnerable services running that we're not aware of, they may be running old or outdated versions of software vulnerable to network attacks, and we want to make sure that they will not be vulnerable to the internet at large. So one approach that we can do is to disable services that we don't actually need. So you just go through all of the computers in your network and you turn off all of the services that you're not running. That way you can make sure that if you whatever you are running, you know about it and, and you keep those up to date and so forth. However, this can be harder to do in practice. For one, it's you have to do work for every single computer and every single service. And so if you have hundreds or thousands of systems running dozens of services, that's going to be a lot of different configurations that you have to deal with. And these might be coming from different operating systems, running different hardware and things like that. And it's quite possible that you're running services that you're not even aware that you're doing. So this approach of minimizing the services uh, that you offer by removing ones you don't need is a good one. However, it has a scalability issue um, in practice that you have to do work for every single instance of a service. So one way that we can deal with this is to reduce complexity by imposing something that monitors traffic and disallows it before it even enters the network. And this is the idea of a firewall. So a firewall reduces risk by blocking outsiders from accessing network resources within some organization. So the firewall monitors traffic coming out of the, out of the network from inside and coming into the network from outside and acts as a single point which can effectively disable services for thousands of hosts. If an organization decides they don't want to offer SSH uh, to anyone outside of the internet, they can simply disallow all uh, SSH traffic uh, by having a firewall block the port 22 and that's the end. No more traffic on port 22 would be allowed to enter the network. And so instead of going to every single computer that is under their control and making sure all of them are, have their uh, SSH uh, servers disabled, they can do it with one single configuration on a machine that disables it for however many computers happen to be within their organization. Now, the effectiveness of a firewall is thus based on its policy. So the policy decides who is allowed to talk to whom and which services are allowed to be used. So it can decide whether or not this machine can be talked to and if it can be talked to, which ports can it be which ports can be used in that communication. And it also has a fundamental distinction between inbound and outbound connections. So an inbound connection is an attempt by external users, so anyone on the internet in effect, to connect to services on internal machines. So for instance, if you wanted to access a web server, you could be anyone on the internet connecting to a specific web server on a, on a specific machine inside your network. 
In contrast, an outbound connection are attempts by internal users to connect to services on external machines. So now we're talking about uh, employees, for example, within the organization who are just using their computers and connecting to something like Google.com. All of the traffic will go through the firewall, be it inbound or outbound. And the firewall is able to make access control decisions separately, allow different kinds of traffic to be to be let through or to be denied to be let through, depending on whether it's coming from inside the organization and going out or coming from outside, basically from anyone on the internet coming into the organization. So threat models may decide which of these which of these inbound or outbound are riskier and a typical threat model would have that inbound connections are riskier than ex uh, outbound connections because of the fact that internal users have some sort of implicit authentication these are people who have physical access to the building have keys to offices have passwords to log on to computers that are hooked up uh, physically into the network uh, the organization. So there is some implicit amount of trust for these internal users. And external users can be anyone on the internet. So this is, in effect, unauthenticated users. This is network traffic that can come from any place uh, any place on, uh, on the world at large, and there is no sort of implicit trust about the people uh, that are making these connections. On the other hand, you can have other threat models. So for instance, if you just want to censor people and prevent people under your control from accessing certain information, then you might be more concerned about internal users and what they're allowed to access than as opposed to external users. So an example security policy is as follows. So we could say that internal users can connect to any service. So internal users are free to uh, connect to the internet at large, whereas external users, that is the internet at large, is restricted. So we allow, we permit connections to an HTTP service running on port 40 or port 80 and port 443. So the HTTP and the HTTPS ports. And we deny, for example, connections to the printer service on port 631. So this allows anyone on the internet to access um, a web page that we were running on a web server somewhere in our organization, but they're not allowed to send print jobs to the physical printers within the organization. Now, if we don't explicitly allow or deny, permit or deny some particular traffic, then the question is, how do we handle it? So it could be the case that we list all the things we allow and we list all the things we deny, but traffic that we see doesn't happen to uh, belong to any of these ones that we've explicitly listed. So there's two default policies then that can exist in this world. The first policy is that you, in by default, allow all traffic that's not explicitly has a decision in the policy. So it's not explicitly mentioned whether it's allowed or denied. So if it's not mentioned, it's in by default allowed. The alternative is the default deny. So we deny anything that isn't otherwise explicitly mentioned. So what's nice about the default allow position is that it is better for the usability of the people within the organization. For example, if you want to start using some new service, say some new protocol comes into existence and it uses a particular port, well, if the, the default allow position prevents all traffic that isn't explicitly, that isn't already, or if the if there is no existing rule that decides what to do in that case, then the default allow would permit this traffic to go through. So new traffic that hasn't already been seen before would, by default, be permitted. And then if it turns out that this is could be used for bad traffic or there's vulnerabilities attached to this or it's not a good idea to allow it, then it can be set as a new rule after the fact. So if problems arise, then a policy is added that disallows this kind of traffic. In contrast, the default deny position would offer more security at the cost of this benefit of usability. So now, unless something is specifically allowed, we allow, say, SSH and web and, and other things that are not on this list, 
will always be denied. And in this case, now you might get a new service that uses a particular port and people can't use it, and then they have to go and complain. And they and they say, I need to have this port opened up so that I can actually use this traffic. And whoever's in charge of the firewall or the security of the organization can audit these requests, approve changes, and update the firewall accordingly. So both of these default positions have a sort of reaction to new kinds of traffic that they're not explicitly dealing with, and the difference is in how they handle it. In the one case, it's allowed, which promotes usability, but at the risk of security. In the other case, it's denied, which improves security, but costs the usability. So the questions to think about then are which do our design principles that we talked about at the beginning of the course would recommend, and which would notice flaws faster and with less risk or, or less risk to particular users or to the organization. And as well, something to think about is the balance of, and consequences of false positives and false negatives. So a false positive would be when we falsely allow traffic through our network. We allow traffic, but we should have denied. And a false negative is when we deny traffic that we should have allowed. And because security is often at odds with usability, and here is no exception, we can think about the consequences of false positives and negatives as well as the amount of them uh, in terms of security and usability as well. And these are, factors are always relevant when making binary decisions with imperfect uh, information. So the most basic kind of a firewall is a packet filter. And a packet filter is basically a router with a list of access control rules. So it sits in the network, it receives all incoming and outgoing traffic, it sits at the right before it this traffic would go to or come from the internet at large, and it examines all of the traffic and compares information from the, pa from the packets to its access control rules. And what happens here is it checks each packet that it receives against the rules and decides what to do. So it either forwards the packet if it if it decides to allow based on the access control rules, if it allows the traffic, it then forwards it to the correct host within the organization or to the internet at large, or alternatively, it simply drops the packet entirely. That is, it pretends like it never received it in the first place. So each rule specifies which packet it applies to based on the packet's header. So these packet filters are stateless in the sense that they consider each packet in isolation, not in terms of the bigger picture of the entire communication that these, this packet is a part of. So it only looks at the packet that it's currently processing and uses its information from its headers to decide what to do. So it uses the source and destination IP addresses, it uses the ports, and it uses the, whether it's UDP or TCP, the protocol that it's using. It's using that to make decisions. And there's an asterisk, a wildcard character. So if we want to say disallow from any IP address to a particular port, we don't have to explicitly list every single IP address that can exist. So here I have an example of a packet filter set, uh, a simple rule. So the rule is allow TCP 1234 port 1025 to 10.0.0.1 port 80. So this rule is saying that traffic coming from IP address 1234 all, and port, uh, client side port 1025, and going to a particular IP address, the HTTP uh, port 80 on a particular machine 10.0.0.1 is allowed. So if the packets, if all of the headers in the packet match this rule, then the decision applies either allow or deny. And in this case, it's an example of an allowed, uh, allowed packet. And we can see as well that the in the second example, we replace the specific port 1025 with an asterisk, meaning it can be any port on the client side. And of course, this is more sensible because typically client side ports are just randomly chosen by the operating system, not chosen by the application itself. So it's not that if it's coming from 1025, it's allowed, but maybe we want to have a deny for other ports. More likely, we want to say whatever port it's coming from from the client side we want to apply the same decision. It, the, what matters in this case is they're trying to talk to our HTTP server, and we either allow or deny this IP uh, this this connection to exist. 
And as well, we can imagine as well replacing the source IP address with an asterisk as well. In this, if we were trying to implement the rule, we allow HTTP traffic to this machine from anyone on the internet, or we disallow HTTP traffic from anyone on the internet to this particular machine. So the way that these are implemented, the rules can be ordered. And they are ordered in a list, so you just have a sequential list of these rules. And the mechanism is that the first rule that actually applies, where that is all of the header information matches, the IP addresses, the ports, and the uh, protocol, TCP or UDP, if they all match, you know, up to including whether if there's a wild card, if the wild card applies, then it would be considered a match, then the decision is made. So even if a more specific rule appears later on, for instance, refining an asterisk into a specific port number, even though the second rule in this in this in the first example listed here has a has a closer match to particular traffic it would still be the case that the first rule to apply makes the decision. So the second rule is now inconsequential in this case. The, if, if traffic goes to port 80 um, from IP address 1234 and to machine 10.0.0.1, then it is denied because rule 1 says to deny it. And rule 2 will simply never make any decisions because all of the decisions would be already made that it could apply to would have already been made by rule one. And similarly, in the second example, we have allowing it on port 80, and then we have a deny on all ports, and that asterisk includes port 80. But in this case, because we have a rule that applies specifically to port 80 earlier, that would be the rule that applies. So in this case, we're allowing port 80 and then disallowing all other ports. And this excludes port 80 because there's an explicit rule for port 80 that would allow it. All right, so now that you've seen this syntax, the question you can think about is how would you implement the default deny rule? How would you implement the default allow rule? And where, what would it actually look like? And how would you place it in a packet filter list relative to the other rules in that list? So considerations for firewalls. Firewalls can have thousands of these filtering rules that decide whether or not to allow or deny traffic. And this can create a huge amount of complexity. And thus, it's easy to introduce subtle errors that may exist. Um, if you're just deciding to allow or deny a new kind of traffic, you not only need to get the rule right, but you need to actually position it in the correct place so that it impacts makes the decision correctly and doesn't impact other services that may be trying that whose decisions were supposed to be made correctly but are no longer being made. So these need to be tested correctly. There should be unit tests where example kinds of traffic are sent through it and it makes these decision to allow or deny based on that to make sure that new changes that you're making to your firewall policy don't have a negative impact on specific decisions that you, you are sure should be made. Not only that, firewalls, not only do they provide inbound security from threats coming from the network at large, for the internet at large, but they also have outbound policy enforcement. So they could disallow, for instance, traffic to particular IP addresses if an organization wanted to disallow the use of a social media uh, on their networks. Or, for instance, if they didn't want to allow a certain kind of traffic, so a BitTorrent traffic, for example, running on a particular port, they may disallow that traffic while allowing other kinds of traffic, right? And these would be now decisions that an organization makes about what their employees or whoever sits within their organization are allowed to do with the internet at large. So in this case, it's allowing a form of censorship for outbound traffic as well as network security for inbound traffic. And another uh, technical aspect about firewalls is that once an outbound connection is permitted, the reverse traffic is then uh, allowed afterwards. So if some internal IP on a port connects to some external websites uh, on port 443, for example, then that traffic is allowed to come back. The replies are allowed to come from the external uh, IP address on that particular port as long as it goes directly to the machine that 
uh, made that request in the first place. So in this case, it's a, uh, it's where the firewall opens up a, a port and thereby allows connections to then go out. So why have firewalls been so successful? Well, one aspect is that they allow a central control that's very easy to administrate, it's easy to update, and there's one single point of control. So if you need to change anything, you don't need to update thousands of computers. You can just change one single configuration file. This allows for a rapid response after changing it. And an example of where this is very useful could be if a vulnerability was discovered in a popular HTTP server, you would have to go to all the machines that are running that version of the HTTP server and stop it from running it. But a quicker fix would be to simply disallow HTTP traffic immediately and then fix the machines, update the machines, get rid of, stop them from running their services, and then re-allow HTTP traffic back again. So you're able to respond quickly to a new threat by disallowing all of the traffic, fixing the issue, and then re-permitting re the traffic to go through. It's also very easy to deploy. You're not interacting with everyone's computer and turning off services. You just have this one machine that no one even notices is there. It's transparent to the end users, and it's just sitting between the users and the internet, processing the metadata of all their traffic. So it's successful because it addresses an actual problem. These security vulnerabilities in network services are rampant, and it's easier to disallow access than to secure them. New vulnerabilities will always exist. There may be vulnerabilities we don't know about yet. We just have to accept that these vulnerabilities do exist and pose a threat, and it's easier to control access using a firewall that just disallows the traffic than to make sure every machine is up to date, running secure software, and so forth. And as mentioned earlier, easy to disable if a new vulnerability appears. You can just turn off that service and, and deal with that issue without traffic coming in that's exploiting it. Disadvantages of firewalls is, of course, there is some functionality loss. If you are disallowing kinds of traffic or disallowing traffic to go through, you are necessarily reducing the functionality. Now, if that functionality happens to be a track, attack traffic, that's a good thing. However, it could be the case that some applications or some network services don't work if for instance, both endpoints are behind firewalls that don't allow communication to go through, and now you can no longer use the services that you were hoping to use. Another disadvantage is that of the insider threat. There's a sort of implicit assumption in general deployment of firewalls is that the insiders are trusted because those are the ones you've authenticated and uh, have a notion of who these users actually are, this discrimination between inbound and outbound traffic. And of course, this may not always be the case. Sometimes the threat is coming from inside the organization. What firewalls do is they create a security perimeter around the building, in a sense, where it all of the out tra traffic from outside is monitored and traffic coming from inside and going outside is monitored, but it could be the case that threats are happening within the organization and the firewall then won't detect that. Right? Threats can come from laptops, threats can come from cell phones that are running software that's compromised, and if these cell phones are connected to the wireless network of an organization, then this network should also be considered with like being processed with a firewall as well because if these phones are running code that can perform attacks against the network, against the organization, then it does in fact pose a threat. So you would want to make sure that you're monitoring the traffic that's coming from these devices as well. As well, firewalls can be easily circumvented. Uh, these packet filters have a limited contextual model. They're not reconstructing the traffic. They're not understanding exactly what is happening. They're simply looking at the headers. They're looking at the IP header and the TCP or UDP headers and making decisions based on the ports and IP addresses. They're not looking at the actual data that's going through because if they had a rich contextual model, they could say, don't allow attack traffic, but allow good traffic, right? And even when you're running a web service, you could be running a web service that has a vulnerability and the traffic you're allowing that can exploit this vulnerability. And we'll talk about web security in later lectures. But the point is that there can be traffic you're allowing by a matter of policy, which is still going to cause attacks to occur. So it's, it's not a perfect solution in, in that regard. 
As well, if you're being censored, if the firewall is implementing a form of censorship, there's many opportunities that an internal user has to get around that as well. And so they could access forbidden, they can still, despite being denied access, they can still get around it to access forbidden content and forbidden services. And uh, if this was uh, the normal lectures that we would have in person, this would be the moment where I would solicit from the audience uh, examples of how this may be. So I encourage you uh, to take a pause and reflect and think about different ways that you could do it because in the next slide I will give the answers. So uh, different circumvention techniques. One is to abuse ports. So for example, the DNS port, port 53 on UDP is used for DNS. Right, And this has to be allowed for the internet to work. If you don't permit DNS traffic to go through, you're going to have a very hard time offering any services, doing name service resolves, allowing people to access the DNS in general. So frequently it is the case that even when you're connecting to a Wi-Fi that you have to then log into uh, as a second, once you connect to public Wi-Fi and there's this login screen um, before you're allowed to continue, Often DNS is still allowed. So DNS traffic is being allowed to be processed, but web traffic, for example, isn't allowed to be processed, or they could de deny any kinds of traffic like BitTorrent as well. The point about port abuse is that these ports, these numbers are just a convention. They're not a rule. It's not that BitTorrent can't go over port 53 or web traffic can't go over port port 53. It's just the Internet uh, Association for n num Names and Numbers um, uh, that decide what these ports are and, and what port is used for this and what port is used for that has dis decided that 53 is a good one for DNS and, and 80 is the one to use for HTTP traffic. But these are just a convention. There's absolutely no regulation that prohibits their use. It just makes the Internet not work as conveniently if you try to use ports, non-standard ports for things. So if you could just get the service, the remote service, the thing running, um, for instance, BitTorrent, to also use port 53 over UDP, then the firewall will allow this traffic because unless it's actually looking at the traffic itself, it won't notice it. If it's just superficially looking at the headers, then it'll allow it through and your traffic can persist. As well, you can have your own service that you run. So you might have a DNS name service that you're running at your house. And you just, instead of uh, resolving names, you just actually route traffic. So in this case, you want to say connect to download some website. Instead of using port 80 to connect to that website, you do a DNS lookup on your own name server that you control by looking up some name that encodes the information you want to transmit. And then your DNS server doesn't actually run DNS, it then does an HTTP GET request based on what you have asked for, returns the result as a DNS reply. So this is known as IP over DNS, as another way of just circumventing the idea of, of a firewall for either for censorship or blocking traffic. You can use non-standard ports and you can run your own services to route your own traffic to help facilitate the use of non-standard ports. As well, you can make use of a relay. So a relay is a program that would be listening on a port that's not blocked. So again, this, this has a similar nature to the IP over DNS, right? So you let's say you're allowing HTTP traffic. Well, then you can just run an HTTP server at your house and connect to it from where you are blocked by a firewall. And then instead of actually serving HTTP, your HTTP service is actually a relay. It looks at the traffic that you're sending it, and then it actually processes the rest of the traffic. So your traffic could say, I'm doing an HTTP get for a particular host, but that is, uh, and that host is one that you control. And then the actual traffic is just, please send the rest of this packet to this IP and port. And then your relay routes the traffic as it was desired, gets the reply, sends it back to you. And so the question based on this is how might this be detected, right? Like an IP, a firewall that is only looking at packet header would not be able to detect this. But how might uh, a more advanced firewall detect that this sort of traffic is actually happening? And are there defenses against that detection that can further allow the, the person to evade censorship? All right.
that is the end of this lecture.